Swinburne University of Technology. The liberal feminists were probably the most successful and the ones we identify most so readily with the feminist movement. And these were these were the women who were uh, okay, the, the liberal feminists argued that the, the big problem that women had wasn't necessarily patriarchy. It was in fact equality and access to the high levels of society and access to um, opportunity that was the problem. Um, that women were constrained in their ability to move to higher and higher levels of expression and particularly back then through um, uh, access to university, um, through access to, to high level management jobs uh, because of the sort of the boys clubby notion of, of patriarchy um, and because there was no support from the institutional world that is governments and, and, and big business if you like. So the, the liberal feminists work hard, worked hard to create this notion that, that given an opportunity women will rise um, and that, that merit um, should be how how women are dealt with, not not sex or gender, as um, they would argue. Gender being the concept that that um, men, in terms of of their expression of their maleness, the masculine sort of drive to achieve, to compete, was the thing that made men particularly um, fit for higher level. Um, activity uh, you know in government or, or in business so women argued that this wasn't the case that women if given the opportunity could rise not necessarily compete on that 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 same sort of gendered level but if we created a circumstance where the skills and abilities and intelligence of women was was given an opportunity to to flourish then um, patriarchy wouldn't matter because women would rise and and be equal and be shown to be equal to men in terms of function um, and and of course then everything would be right with the world because we would have an appropriate sort of division of labor between men and women that isn't constrained by understandings about gender about you know the feminine being associated with the domestic sphere and the mas masculine being associated with the worldly sphere sphere like uh, Parsons argued um, and the the great achievement of, of liberal feminism was to create equal opportunity legislation which started itself uh, started its life as uh, positive discrimination um, that is, jobs were made available exclusively for women for a very short period of time um, and I suppose once certain people were satisfied that, that women were equal to the task, equal opportunity legislation in government uh, but also e equal opportunity practice in, in corporations then allowed women to, to rise up through, through the ranks and achieve to a much greater extent than they had before and to a certain extent this 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 worked reasonably well um, we still we still don't have equality um, but we've come a long way uh, women still earn around 84 cents to every male dollar um, there's still uh, an over expectation on women um, linked to the domestic sphere, linked to child care. Um, if you, you think about the, um, the, the debate just in the last couple of years about maternity leave, it was going to be family leave and it was always couched in family leave terms, but then when the money got tight, both political parties pulled back and it ended up being maternity leave. Um, so there's still this, this struggle over, over the, the uh, female responsibility for children and for time out of work and that's still a struggle that, that women have to deal with to the extent that, that women have choice about engaging in that or not, fine, but to the extent where, where there is, um, where women are forced um, to seek um, um, separate sort of conditions that are exclusive to them because of, of the sort of sexual biology in the, the sense that they have children and that the, their their careers may be um, may be curtailed or uh, restrained uh, because they give birth despite the fact that business always wants a greater population 
Um, and there are only two basic ways to get a greater population at the moment. That is, you bring people in or you produce your own people. Um, and this, I'm always uncomfortable about this and it's never really dealt with very well that, that um, we have this expectation, uh, business expectation of, of increasing the population, therefore increasing the, the human resources we have, but by the same token those who are going to supply that uh, are the ones who are penalised to a much greater extent. But nonetheless, liberal feminism did create the notion that there should be equal access and equal opportunity and and that's now been turned into black letter law. So the work that these liberal feminists did to, to get from a stage where um, when I was going to school, if a woman got married, certainly if she got pregnant, she was expected and in some cases forced to leave the workforce to, to hide this, this sort of there's a sort of this funny prurient view, I think, that informs this, that, that, that where, where women's sexuality or uh, 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 evidence of that um, is publicly displayed, it needs to be hidden, hidden quickly. Um, uh, so we've moved from that state in the 60s and, and where women were getting about half the wages of men simply because they were women. Um, to this, the, the situation we find now where there is an expectation that, that all women have the potential for equal access and that equal access is underwritten by legislation and by practices in, in the corporate world, liberal feminists did a fantastic job. The, the social Marxist, socialists and Marxist feminists um, uh, also focused on patriarchy. Um, the difference with the socialist Marxists, and these were a relatively small, small movement, and sort of discreet, I think, to the 70s, where we, you know, we had the, the communist capitalist um, struggle going on um, in terms of which organising system was, was the one that was going to sort of win. Um, uh, the socialist Marxists had, had the idea that, that uh, women were subject to two lots of oppression. They were, uh, they were oppressed by the, the patriarchy, but they were also oppressed by the, um, the capitalist system as well. So they were not only uh, oppressed by their lack of access, um, in the same way that liberal feminists argued, they were also oppressed because um, being confined to the domestic sphere and have a husband who came in from sort of the capitalist cold, if you like, um, their job was to nurture, protect, love, sort of replenish the forces of, of the male spirit sort of overnight so that he could then be released back to the, the corporate world to start producing an income for, uh, for the capitalists. So they were not only um, limited uh, in their access to the economic world, they also had this double task um, to then care for the 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 refugees, the overnight refugees, if you like, from capitalism, and nourish them in all ways, um, so that they went out in in a much better state. Um, so that this 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 was this was sort of a classic Marxist discourse. Um, interestingly, Marx had a um, a benefactor or a mentor um, named Engels, and Engels. Um, Engels sort of took Marx in, in a sense, and supported him uh, to, to write and do his work. And Eng Engels was um, interesting in that the one of the things he, he focused on was, was, was the, the plight that women found themselves, and this is going back um, to, the, to the 19th century, but you know, identifying the idea of women as property, um, and this was the, uh, the thing I was talking a little bit about in, in the marriage and family. Um, lecture where where you had this you know I was I was arguing that this idea that marriage was always between a man and a woman it was always romantic and it was always about producing children was not right and this is Engels um, uh, work on this this showed that to be the case that women were really a part of property rights and and were uh, marriage was then used to to establish and maintain the the sort of the patriarchal line because you could um, 
uh, sort of trap a woman's sexuality, um, if you like, their, bio their ability to sexually reproduce in the marriage and, and produce the heir so that in a way that the, the patriarchy could be certain that, that the child that was produced was their progeny. So um, Engels did some, some, some of the basic groundwork um, that, that the feminists were able to, to follow up on. So the feminism, and, and now there have been various feminisms since, since the, um, the second wave, um, you know, third wave feminism, lipstick feminism, postmodern feminism. Um, there's there's a, a, a sort of discrete form of French feminism, which is um, sort of associated with this, this thing I described called post-structuralism, or there's a psychoanalytic feminism as well um, that's based on Freud's work. Um, those you can pursue separately if you're interested. They, they, they don't need to be understood for sort of this sort of basic third, first year sociology course. Um, suffice to say that there is has been an emerging struggle between the second wave feminists who are all sort of around my age in their the sort of late fifties and early sixties um, um, who who uh, have felt they've had to come come back out to try and deal with some of the shifts and changes in sort of female politics if if you like um, um, okay I'll just slip back one stage before that there was a critique in in the 90s um, by um, the woman who bought in inverted commas the second wave feminist argument that you could have it all there was this this notion that probably was was unfair and exaggeration that that second wave feminism particularly liberal feminism promised that you could have the job you could have the 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 career you could have the family you could has, have the husband you could have the children you could have everything and what what a lot of women found and i'm sure what a lot of you still find and what i found in in my private life in my family life was it's very difficult when you have two people with a career um, to find these windows of opportunity to have children to bring up children and um, divide the labor between the two fairly and so a lot of women, no, not a lot of women, but there were certain women um, who went to the popular media, a couple of books were written about it, about this, the buying, buying this bill of goods from, from liberal feminism that you could have it all. And, a lot, and there, were, there were certain women who found they got to sort of their early 40s where having children could be sort of a biological problem. Um, and they'd missed out and the, they devoted themselves to their career and the development of their career uh, and then got to 40 and going, oh, fuck it. I haven't got it all and I've just found myself working probably harder than I wanted to, um, partly because the argument would go that women have to work harder, still work harder to prove themselves. And so there was this, this discrete discourse about the promises of second wave feminism and the reality that was lived by by the feminists who followed on bringing it back to what i was saying a, a couple of minutes ago there's there's been this discourse between sort of third wave feminists and second wave feminists where the second wave feminists feminists are, are thinking that the the modern the sort of younger younger women who aren't necessarily the identifying as feminists assume that the work's all done and that they can have everything they can look good this is sort of the lipstick feminist high heels short skirts we can do whatever we want um, and all of the battles have been won and put to bed and they don't have to worry anymore and the second wave feminists is, uh, are arguing that now there is this backsliding um, that women still have to battle and fight um, and that that possibly there's a bit of a sellout of the sort of feminist values from the the second wave, um, the slut walks we've had um, in the last couple of years, uh, originating in Canada and 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 um, happening in Australia, I think last year in particular, troubled the second wave feminists, um, but also highlighted the fact that that maybe women haven't moved on, that that women have to regulate themselves, their bodies, their appearance. Um, in the same way that they always have, but 
um, the, the argument, the contention between the second wave and the third wave, if you like, um, that you can't simply um, take back this notion of slut in the same way that nigger was taken back by black people in sort of this relatively short period period of time um, and then you there were this there's another movement uh, there was the girls gone wild movement um, where and, and it was particularly strong in America not so strong in Australia um, where women were encouraged to reveal themselves in front of cameras um, girls gone wild you I, I, it's still on the internet I'm sh I imagine um, where women were valued for and, and encouraged by men, by packs of men, by groups of men to expose themselves and they got on camera and they had this sort of celebrity and fame which is sort of part of the, the surrounding culture these days, was also part of the backslide um, um, that young women would say was just their right to to engage in, in life in the way they wish to when it wasn't going to have a detrimental effect. The second wave feminists were, going, were arguing, well you can't you can't have your cake and eat it too, if you like, in in those those sort of contexts, because uh, you're you're playing into the objectifying game that that patriarchy has always subjected women to. So there's an interesting interesting tussle in in feminism um, at the moment. So in the um, uh, in the nature, you'll see there there are a couple of leading feminists that. that um, I've talked about. Now, in terms of postmodernism um, um, and the, um, the, sort of the, the, the modern theorists, um, I've, I've, I've talked earlier about the shift from modernism to postmodernism and then the challenge um, in recent times about the whole postmodernism, postmodernist approach to understanding the way the world works. Um, have a read of the postmodern stuff. It's. It, I don't want to. I don't want to overly complicate things for you, um, because postmodernism, postmodernity was was sort of a French theoretical movement that was strong in the 80s, flowed into the 90s. There's sort of been a fight back, if you like, by the the sort of more traditional theorists that argue that we really didn't have a postmodernist period. Um, in fact modernism contained all of the things that the postmodern modernist argued that was the that rose up in the 80s this and essentially postmodernism said that look science has failed a scientist science has let us down the scientific approach the enlightenment approach has let us down um, that you can't have explanations for everybody at all at once and at one time um, Experts aren't really what they claim to be. People like me sitting here talking about sociology is one thing, but simply because I'm an expert, I have a, a PhD, society may ask me to comment on all sorts of things because they assume I may, my opinion is more valid because of my qualification. The postmodernists came along and, and argued that this isn't the case, that, that there are discrete knowledges that, that all people have and that are, uh, that are worth knowing so that, that we, that the, the, the proletariat, if you like, should invade the academy, uh, should invade government, should invade the church, should invade business and, and try and fracture this notion that, the, that there are these organising systems that, that are right for all of us at one time. Um, in, in the sociological theoretical world the argument then the fight back argument is that well now this this attitude and approach of challenging was always contained in modernism and maybe you would argue that conflict theory which was the Marxist and the feminist approach um, contained some of those sort of anti-establishment um, um, contrary um, attacks on on these totalizing forces that, that, that are having us conform to certain practices were always there. That's sort of it in a nutshell, but don't get too, don't get too worried if you're not quite getting it because it's, it's, it's to a certain extent been put to bed. You'll hear postmodern modern, modernism, which is the incorrect term anyway, talked about in, in sort of popular discourse. 
I don't really think people understand what they're talking about when, or I know some of them don't understand what they're talking about when they talk about postmodernism in the popular press or the popular media. So don't worry too much about it. Lots written on it and there's, there's, there's stuff for you to read, but at the moment, um, uh, we'll, we'll sit with that. And then there are the, the current theorists, uh, Anthony Giddens, whose book, hello mate. <laughs> hello Tim. Oh, this is Tim. Turn around and say hello to Tim. Hello, this is my, these are my PSS 100 students. Oh, hello. <laughs> Tim's, Tim's the one who's, who's written all of that uh, assistance with writing and studying. Yeah, yeah, so, so he's the, the language and learning hero that you've been relying on through the last 12 weeks to, <laughs> to get you through. See you, Tim. Um, so the, the Anthony Giddens, this was that, that book I showed you earlier, the, the sixth edition, that thing that says sixth edition up there, the Anthony Giddens book. Giddens, um, um, uh, Giddens had, had developed a theory called structuration and the idea of structuration was this, I, I spoke right at the beginning about the agency structure debate, individuals versus institutions and you know, there's always a struggle between them and, and the more powerful you are as an individual, the greater your agency, the less power you are as an individual, the, the less agency you have, that is influence on, on institutions. Giddens th th thought that was a false dichotomy and developed this theory called structuration, which sort of combined those two, which was sort of a common sense, if you like, approach to, to understanding how, how society works. Um, Ulrich Beck um, was another theorist um, who particularly took up the notion of globalization and the, so the, modern, the modern sort of fear or potential fear we live in that he characterized as the risk society um, that, that we're, society works on risk to a much greater extent than it has before. Um, uh, there's Manuel Castells. Um, who looked at the, the information revolution and the net, network society. George Ritzer, who's, who's an interesting and charming man who I've met a couple of times, an American guy who developed the theory of McDonaldization, that is um, the practices of the fast food industry, M McDonald's in particular, um, their practices get overlaid on, on our corporate and our social life um, to sort of homogenize processes of society um, captured with the four categories he sort of calls calculability, efficiency, predictability and control. Um, and if you think of the pra practices of producing Big Macs that, that are, um, are, have input, input costs and, and ways of manufacturing that, that are always uh, always easy to calculate that the what's produced is always predictable um, some would say consistent um, and that you you are much able much more able to control the processes that qual quantity equals quality um, he's he's developed that theory and overlaid it across the sort of modern society um, which works well and then there's a um, fellow called Pierre Bourdieu um, uh, a French theorist um, who who deals with 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 a number of a number of uh, sort of social issues in, in in sort of including taste and and the body um, um, and finally uh, well no no not quite finally um, a fellow called Zygmunt Bauman who's a, a very interesting great writer one of my favorites. Um, who writes about who's who writes about the writes sort of generally about the 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 sort of modern social condition, particularly sort of critical about commercialization, shopping, um, the postmodern term turn um, that is the move from one thing to another, um, and then looks at uh, he's written written a series of books where he, that he's called. Um, well, he's used the um, the adjective liquid, um, uh, liquid life, liquid, liquid death, um, liquid modernity. The idea that that we live in such a fluid world now that that 
that things change and move in the same way that, that liquid does that's that's worth pursuing but that's that's more sort of a, a broad thesis on society rather than a particular theory and finally a um, uh, a woman called Raywin Connell uh, an Australian sociologist who um, finally addresses and this is a, this is a probably a nice point to finish on addresses what um, in in kind what I was what I was uh, what I started off with this this idea that there's a a, um, a European sociology that that we're focused on that there's there there's there's a juxtaposition between all of these different sociologies throughout the world but we see the European model as the 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 sort of paradigm form of sociology what Connell does is looks at that at, at the sort of the northern European um, Antipodean approach that, that there's this um, um, bias towards uh, a, a view that's dominated by the northern hemisphere and this is sort of inevitably the case um, in in a lot of in a lot of worlds and so uh, because of the the dominance of the population and and the 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 age of the civilization uh, if you like indigenous people set aside um, for the moment um, that the, they would argue that the civilization in Europe has, has um, obviously so so long and deep that, that of course it's it's it has more sort of profound meaning um, and sort of truth in inverted commas embedded in it but but Connell's uh, addressed this and come up with this thing called southern theory which looks at the social world from an antipodean perspective sort of looking back at Europe and then suggesting that that, that we actually have uh, responses in in sort of a slightly Weberian way in that so we're moving up to to affect the the structure so um, Connell's, Connell's an interesting um, an interesting theorist um, to have a look at not primarily well uh, the, the Connell story is interesting and, and you, you, you can follow through on, on Connell because Bob Connell who's now Ray when Connell wrote about class and gender earlier on and now um, in her 60s she's writing about she's writing this, this theoretical stuff um, not having a profound influence on the whole sociological world but certainly interesting from the Australian perspective. <sighs> That's it everyone. We've got to week 12. Um, I hope it's I hope it's been useful. I hope it's been I hope it's been enjoyable. It's it's certainly been fun doing these for you. I this is this has been a new way of, of doing it that um, that David and I have sort of pioneered because normally you'd be sitting like, like a newsreader reading off your script um, but I think I think this works well it's been it's been great working with David it's been I've, I've felt like I've been communicating with you and I've tried to make it as natural um, as possible and probably sometimes too natural for, for some tastes but um, if it engages you and brings brings you closer to the subject uh, that's probably a good thing. So I hope things go well and um, if you want to get in touch again feel free and uh, maybe I'll see you in the future. See you later. This has been a Swinburne production.